Good morning. Good morning. So I've been doing a series of lectures on the Bodhisattva ceremony, and the last four of them have been on the um, great four great Bodhisattva vows. Beings are numberless, I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable, I vow to become it. So that's the one we're gonna look at today. And we can understand Buddha's way to be uh, the way of Buddha, like what Shakyamuni Buddha did or what a Buddha does, or we can understand this to be the Buddhist teachings. And unsurpassable can be translated as, I vow to become it, I vow to achieve it, I vow to fulfill it, accomplish it, turn into, and embody. So those are all ways that, that this uh, has been translated. So if we understand this to be about the Buddhist teachings, that would be a very, very big area to cover, like thousands of years worth of various ideas about how we understand Buddhist doctrine. So certainly that's not going to be the topic of my lecture today. And even if we're talking about the historical Buddha and how he conducted his life and what his teachings are, that's still a very big field to cover. So because this series of lectures has been about the Bodhisattva ceremony, Ryaka facades, about the various sections and meanings of those parts of the ceremony, for that reason, I'm going to talk about this particular verse, being's way is unsurpassable, I vow to become it, through the lens of the Bodhisattva ceremony. And so that's what we'll talk about today and how that the Bodhisattva ceremony relates to our practice or the path of our practice. So as you may recall, this ceremony begins with a verse of repentance followed by the homages to the Buddhas and ancestors, uh, praise of the Buddhas, and then that's followed by the four Bodhisattva vows, which we've been lecturing on, which I've been lecturing on. Then there is taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha, and then finally the recitation of the Bodhisattva precepts. So we recite the repentance verse, the homages, and the Bodhisattva vows three times. And each, by reciting them three times, this makes them real and binding throughout the cycle of our rebirths and in our path of practice. So in Buddhism, when we recite something three times, it gives it a kind of gravitas, uh, a way in which it truly enters into our body and mind. Perhaps we could say we are imprinted with that. So many of our ceremonies, we repeat things three times, like the robe chant in the morning. We repeat that three times. So because I'm discussing the last of these 40, these last of these four vows, Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to become it. Um, I want to talk about the path and vow. And so in Dogen's Kai Sai San Shuku, which means sound of the stream, form of the mountain fascicle, which is not the same as the mountains and rivers fascicle, which some of you are probably familiar with. And also this fascicle is the source of the Ehe Hotsu Ganmon, which many of you studied with Jaku last year, which was Ehe, which is another name for Dogen, Ehe's vow. So let's look at here is something that Dogen said in that fascicle. He said, after we have produced the thought of Bodhi, Bodhi being the mind of Buddha, after we have produced the thought of Bodhi, though we may turn round in the six destinies and the four births, which means though we may go through the cycle of rebirth through the six realms and be reborn in various ways, the causes and conditions of that turning, of that process of rebirth, all become the practice of the vow of Bodhi, 
the vow of Buddha mind. Hence, though we may have spent our previous years and months in vain, while this life is not yet exhausted, we should quickly make a vow. So even if you've been wasting time like mad, this is like any project, right, that we're engaged in. Even though we've been wasting time, as soon as we apply ourselves and start doing this, you know, that counts. It's like this moment, this moment, and this moment, and this moment. 100%, it counts. So then he offers this vow. He said, we should quickly make a vow. And the vow is, I pray that together with all living beings from this life, through life after life to come, I shall hear the true Dharma. That whenever I hear it, I shall not doubt it and fail to believe in it. And that when I encounter the true Dharma, casting aside the worldly Dharma, I shall accept the Buddha Dharma. And finally, I shall attain the way together with the whole earth and sentient beings. So that's the vow that Dogen offers. And then the next thing he says, after making this vow, he said, when we make a vow in this way, it will naturally be the cause and condition of correctly bringing forth the mind of Bodhi. So he's saying this vow is the cause and condition of the mind of the Buddha. These four Bodhisattva vows are an expression of what Dogen's talking about here as a foundational practice of bringing forth this mind of Buddha. He says, and he goes on and he says, this mindset is not to be neglected. Then he says, what is difficult to see and hear when we study the way is the mindset of the true Dharma. So he's saying, you know, this is hard. It's hard to understand the mindset of the true Dharma. But he says, this mindset is what Buddha after Buddha has transmitted. It is transmitted as both the radiance of the Buddha and as the Buddha mind. So he's putting a great deal of emphasis and importance on this mindset, saying that this is what is transmitted Buddha after Buddha, this radiance and this Buddha mind. So for Dogen, this is a prescription for practice. And this is in line with these four great Bodhisattva vows. Dogen saying that once we've decided to follow the Buddhist path, or we've decided to follow Buddha way, no matter our rebirths from the past or in the future, something awesome and permanent has shifted in our karmic stream. And the way this happens is through the power of these vows. So later on in the passage, he tells us that following the way of the Buddhas, we can find in our own mind this, this Bodhi mind. We can find in our own mind the Buddha mind or the mindset of the Buddhas and ancestors. So I would suggest to you that the whole of the Bodhisattva ceremony is a blueprint for this endeavor, for awakening and stabilizing and following our Buddha mind. So let's look at how the ceremony unfolds. Before we even enter the Buddha hall, or as we're entering the Buddha hall, we begin by purifying our robes with incense. Thus we are purifying ourselves. And after we are purified, we enter into the Buddha field of this ceremony in the Buddha hall, or in our case, in the Zendo. We line up, we face the altar, purified. We become the assembly of this Buddha field, of benefaction, this Buddha field of benefaction. And we open ourselves to what is going to unfold during this ceremony. If you imagine that you were looking down from above at this ceremony, if you look down from above at us assembled together to do this ceremony, we would see ourselves as Sangha facing the altar, making a great mandala, 
facing the Buddha and entrusting our prayer to the Buddhas and ancestors whom we have called forth to witness this ceremony. And in this way, we embody what Dogen calls the mindset that Buddha after Buddha has transmitted. We bow many times in this ceremony. We touch the earth with our forehead, or we bend at the waist, lowering our head, depending upon our physical abilities. And in this way, we are humbling ourselves, prostrating ourselves to something bigger than ourselves. It is touching the earth. It is grounding ourselves. In some ways, it is like returning to Buddha's realization when Mara said, by what right do you have to say that you have any understanding? And the Buddha touched the earth. This grounding and going back to what is real, going back to what is solid, grounding ourselves, becoming receptive to what we are doing and becoming receptive to what we do not understand about the transformative nature of this ceremony. Dogen said in the quote that I gave earlier, we together, we together with all beings are now receptive to hearing the true Dharma. So we are making ourselves receptive to hearing the true Dharma. We are accepting, as Dogen said, we are now receptive to hearing the true Dharma, accepting the true Dharma and attaining the way with the whole earth, because this is not just the activity of ourselves, but this is the activity of the whole earth and all sentient beings together manifesting the Buddha Dharma. So once we make this assembly, once we enter into this Buddha field, the next thing that happens in the beginning of the ceremony is that we repent our previous misdeeds. These misdeeds that are created through our karmic actions in this lifetime and in others, and we acknowledge the clashes that arise from our delusion and our desires. And we let go of our resistance to this great life we lead with all beings. This life sustains us. It sustains us and all beings throughout time and space. Now we surrender ourselves in each moment, in each bow, we chant and with each bow, each chant and each breath of this ceremony. Earlier, again, going back to the quote that I gave, that I read from Dogen, he said, though we may turn round in the six destinies and four births, the causes and conditions of that turning all become the practice of the vow of Bodhi. So our bowing to our mistakes is the karma of rebirth of causes and conditions. It's also the causes and conditions of that turning, or it's the causes and conditions that open our Bodhi mind. We become receptive and it opens our Bodhi mind, reveals and motivates our practice. These beginning activities of making repentance. And then after that is happened, we do that three times then we call forth the Buddhas and ancestors by name and by category and we call them forth to stand with us, to come forward into this Buddha field and witness and support our activity. Dogen wrote, this mindset of the true Dharma is what Buddha after Buddha has transmitted. So Buddha after Buddha comes forth to support this mindset. We call forth the Buddhas and ancestors through activities such as this ceremony, through our teachers, through faith, through study. We remember the stories of our ancestors like a family 
We tell them over and over again, the stories of koans, the stories of the masters who came before us, the men and women who have done this practice for hundreds and hundreds of years. Each telling of those stories brings forth their mindset and what they have transmitted to us. Each exploration and inspirational re-becoming of the Buddha's way inspires us to practice. All of this, all of this is the Buddha way, is the Buddha's way. This ceremony is the Buddha's way. The next part of the ceremony, after making homage to the Buddhas and ancestors, is when we recite these four vows. We say, beings are numberless, I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable, I vow to become it. So in the next series of lectures, I'll talk about the refuges. And the refuges are what come next in this. The refuges are, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. And then after that, in the ceremony, we actually recite the precepts. So in a way, this ceremony is a progression of steps that we may take in our practice. This ceremony expresses our understanding of how we practice. This ceremony is our practice. How do we understand our life and the difficulties in our life? How do we negotiate our suffering, our gratitude, our faith? How do we enact this vow of the Buddhist way? Dogen said, I pray that together with all living beings from this life through life after life to come, I shall hear the true Dharma that whenever I hear it, I shall not doubt it and fail to become it and fail to believe in it. And that when I encounter the true Dharma, casting aside the worldly Dharma, I shall accept the Buddha Dharma. And finally, I shall attain the way together with the whole earth and sentient beings. So first we are born into this life. We are born into this Sangha of being and beings throughout time and space. We're a small part of a big whole, yet our life changes that big whole as we change, as the, the whole of that, of the whole of the world changes us as well. So this whole life, this whole universe is our Buddha field. And I, I want to follow this vow. I, I am sincere in my desire to accept the wisdom and enact this teaching. I want to awaken my Bodhi mind. So what is this Bodhi mind that I, and I'm sure most of you who've been practicing for a while, or even if you haven't, all of us wanna open up this mind, which in a very simple way we can say, it is the mind that realizes that we're in this life together, all beings, everything is together. And that we want to respond and act in a way in which we don't cause harm. We don't cause harm to ourselves, and we don't cause, cause harm to others. And that we may bring peace and an end to suffering of ourself and others through seeing our sameness as well as our differences. This is Buddha. This is Buddha nature. This is our active engagement with the totality of life as it is in a way which is wholesome, helpful, skillful, compassionate, wise. I think everybody, whatever you call this thing, I think all of us in our deepest heart, in our desire, we, this is who we want to be. 
I don't care what you call your religion. This is what we want to be and how we want to conduct ourselves in the world. And of course, sometimes it's a really hard thing to do. But in our tradition, we believe that we are already this thing. We are already because we are of and the world itself. We are not different from this Bodhi mind. But no matter how deep my faith or my intellectual understanding, I fail. And when I fail, then I enter the sacred space of giving myself over to acknowledging that I have failed. This is the repentance of this ceremony. My failure is because the causes and conditions of my present mind and because of my past experience and my past mind. You know, that's just how it is. That's what it's like to be a human being. So by making repentance, by acknowledging my mistakes, I can go forward and make a new effort, 100% new effort. It doesn't absolve me from the responsibilities of the harm that I may have caused and the results of that harm, but I can renew 100% in that moment. By acknowledging my mistakes, I can go forward and make new effort wiser, hopefully, than I was before, and able to transform and make my actions more skillful. So everyone in this ceremony, as we're doing the repentance verses, everyone is reciting this verse with me and with each other. We all fail and we all must re-examine our mistakes. We all must make this effort to enact our Bodhi mind. Without this step, we cannot bring forward our Bodhi mind. Our Bodhi mind will be obscured by our delusion and our inability and our resistance to seeing our mistakes. In that way, we cannot transform our suffering into something that is wholesome and helpful. Our suffering is not in and of itself a problem in the sense that, of course, it is this very suffering that brings about our wisdom. If we had no suffering, could we empathize? If we had no suffering, could we help another person through their own pain? If we have never grieved, could we understand grief? So there's no shame in this. This is how we learn, how we learn by making mistakes. So how do we stand up in the, in the face of our failure? How can we find the strength to continue? We do so by calling forth the strength, the wisdom and compassion of all the ancestors and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who stand with us. So this is the part of the ceremony called the homages. We say homage to Buddha Shakyamuni, which is to say, please come forward. I bring you forward in my mind. Please come to this Buddha field. Please be here with me, which is true for all of the various Bodhisattvas and Buddhas that we call forth, all the ancestors. Well, they may not be apparent to our physical senses, we may not actually see them or hear them. But if we have faith in what they represent in us, then we may see them. Now, Sojin Roshi is an ancestor, and I remember his faith in me, and I call forward, Sojin Roshi, come and stand with me. Now, Suzuki Roshi is an ancestor, and I find strength in his teachings that I have heard over the years, that I have read, and the stories that were transmitted to me from people who knew Suzuki Roshi. I put a statue of Avalokiteshvara on my altar, and I feel the compassionate being who hears the cries of the world, which is to say, I've got you. 
I've got you. And I feel that empathy. And I am encouraged by that. I am not alone. And so this is with every Buddha and ancestor. It is inside us, it is outside us. No inside, no outside, yet inside and outside. These beings stand with us. These beings represent parts of ourselves and they come forth to us as our need requires of them. Furthermore, we all stand here together. We, the assembly, the Sangha, we stand here together, our hands in Gasho, making these vows together, supporting each other. We all share the same aspiration. We support each other in that. We all fall down and we stand up together. We are also the bodhisattvas who encourage and witness our vows. So now that this we've done this through the ceremony, we are hopefully feeling supported and we have recalled our vow. We have recognized that we are foolish human beings. And we also know that we have the support of our Sangha. We have the support of our lineage of the Buddhas and ancestors. We feel strength in this Sangha, seen and unseen. And we feel strength in our own body mind. We remember, we come together in vow. We say, yes, although there are innumerable beings I will encounter, I vow to do my best to respond with compassion, discernment, and skill. We say, yes, I realize that I get caught in my delusion and others do as well. But despite that, I vow to make my best effort at transformation. We say, yes, in every situation and person I meet is right now. This is the place and time of practice. And I will vow that I will intelligently and sincerely stand up, show up. Finally, I say, yes, this is the Buddha's way. It is the Buddha's way. And I am a Buddha. My body, heart, and mind is the body heart and mind of a Buddha. Therefore, I vow that I want to bring forth every bit of Buddhaness that I can muster in each situation. This is the path of Buddha. This is the path of the Bodhisattva. This is our path. This is the Buddha way. When we take refuge in Buddha, ourselves as Buddha, others as Buddha, and our faith in Buddha way, in practice, it is a shelter in the storm of our suffering. Then we say, I also take refuge in the teachings, and I also take refuge in the whole of the earth's activity. And finally, we take refuge in our immediate family, a religious community, and in all beings. The ceremony ends with the recitation of the precepts. Precepts are very specific, yet they're also a koan. This is our life. It is a koan wrapped around the rules of engagement. How is it? What is it? What does it mean to say, I vow not to kill? What does it mean to say, I vow not to steal? Having done all of these things in the ceremony, taken all of these vows, made all the vows, repeated many things three times, having participated in this process of the Bodhisattva ceremony, we engage, re-engage, remember our Buddhist path as it applies to our specific situation, to our specific problems, desires, and delusions. It applies to our joy, our gratitude, and our solidarity with each other. So this ceremony 
is the Buddha's way. It is unsurpassable. And I, this person, this particular person, vow to make her best effort to become it, knowing that I will fail at times and that I will succeed as well. All of this is included. Thank you very much.